of these reflections is through their own eyes liturgy as the Byzantines saw it. They comprise an introduction, liturgy and the appeal to the past, and then two lectures, popular participation in the liturgy, one and two, and then a third, the meaning of it all. By way of preface, I'd like to say that somewhat new in my method in these reflections is what I call liturgy from the bottom up. Professor Jeffrey of Princeton recently put his finger on what he thinks has been the most problematic aspect of liturgical renewal generally, a pervasive unawareness that there is anything to be learned from the social sciences about language, culture, or community, he says. And he comments further in the same essay on how little scholarship there has been done on the lay experience of worship. Similarly, Greek Orthodox Metropolitan Kallistos Ware of Diocleia, reviewing recent work on the Byzantine Divine Liturgy, noted that good work has been done on the history of the Eucharist and on its commentaries. Far less attention, however, has been devoted to the influence of the liturgy on the daily personal life of the people. What impact did the service have upon a Byzantine Christian who was not a trained theologian or a member of the clergy? How widely were the words of the prayers and the symbols of the ceremonies understood by the congregation as a whole? Here is a promising field for future research, he says. My own attention was first drawn to social history via tourism, of all things, while on vacation in Greece as a graduate student in the 1960s. I visited the ruins of Mycenae, the capital of Agamemnon, which struck me at the time as about the size of a football stadium. Vatican City would seem like Russia by comparison. And it suddenly dawned on me that Homer had to be viewed through the other end of the telescope. Once epic events like the Trojan War had to be redimensioned to about the scale of a Manhattan gang rumble in the 1950s. My point is not that this perception was correct, but that, as Nietzsche said, interpretation counts as much as facts. For some time, my own work in Oriental liturgiology has been moving in this direction, shifting away from recent studies on method to more socio-cultural issues, the concrete phenomena of popular liturgical participation as they emerge in the historical documents. In so doing, I have in a sense been responding to my own appeal made 20 years ago when I wrote that one can no longer reconstruct the past only from the top down. What we find in liturgical manuscripts was embedded in a socio-cultural ambience outside of which it cannot be understood as liturgy, something that real people actually did. Furthermore, such literary monuments are a product of high culture, and hence only half of the story. Almost all official church history has been urban history, for it is in the centers of power that history, one view of history at least, is made. Evelyn Patlagian has shown us, however, that the Christian countryside comes to life in the lives of the saints, and so hagiography must also be our potter's clay. In 2001, I reviewed what had been done in liturgical studies during the short span of my own life in liturgical research up to that time. I indicated there some recent studies, most of them in fact not ex professo on liturgy, which have answered, at least in part, my call for liturgical history from the bottom up. Further developments in fields like Byzantine art history, Byzantine cultural history, paleopathological research, the history of preaching, and what one might call socio-pastoral liturgical studies have enlivened considerably our too often stodgy textual and archaeological approaches to the history of late antique and medieval liturgy, including that of Byzantium. In contemporary scholarship across many fields, this approach, variously denominated as the study of everyday life, Ikatimerezoi, la vie quotidienne de Altag, is definitely in. For Byzantium, such studies have ranged from pioneering works like the all encompassing corpus of undigested documentation on Byzantine life, 
collected by Fedor and Kukulis, Russian Byzantinist Alexander Petrovich Kazdan's microscopic concentration on the query, how much did the Byzantines eat, and Gennady Grigorievich Litvarin's How the Byzantines Lived, to Cyril Mangel's Daily Life in Byzantium, Angeliki Laiu's study on the life of Constantinopolitan women, Hans Georg Beck's Orthodoxy und Alltag, Orthodoxy and Everyday Life, a host of recent studies on women in Byzantium, and the exciting new series Réalité Byzantine under the direction of eminent French Byzantinist Cécile Morrison and Jacques Lefort, all dealing with what was really going on in the life of Kajdan's Homo Byzantinus, often as gleaned from the off offbeat sources hitherto ignored. The most recent additions to the genre, the new series entitled A People's History of Christianity, introduces volume two with these words. I quote, The telling of a people's history requires that we read old sources in new ways, while also attending to the sources that have frequently been ignored. A people's history is not an optional addition or a supplement to traditional histories of the Church. Rather, it contributes to a thoroughgoing revision of our understanding of late ancient Christianity as a whole. End of quote. Major sources for studies of this sort reach across the horizon of contemporary scholarship from the enormously rich papyrus evidence of Byzantine Egypt to travel and pilgrimage accounts, popular literature, above all the lives of the saints. Since the pioneering 1917 study of Russian Byzantinist Alexander Pedrovich Rodakov, the huge output of contemporary hagiographers in the historical critical study and editing of the lives and legends of the saints, especially in Belgium and France, but also in Italy, Sweden, Canada, the United States, has stimulated such rapid strides in the field that as John Bolivin remarked, hagiography has become something of a cottage industry over the past half century. In hagiographical and other historical descriptions of the liturgy, purporting to be reliable eyewitness accounts, even their customary hyperbole, that is to say their exaggerations, is objective evidence for our purpose, which aims to see what the Byzantines themselves thought about their services, how they saw and described them even if through tinted glasses, at least conveys what the author considered the liturgical ideal. And if the ideal was in fact unrealized, recounting it testifies to what the witness thought liturgy should be at its best. For example, when such accounts tell us, as they do repeatedly throughout the whole Byzantine era, that the whole city of Constantinople turned out for church services, the exaggeration is obvious but it reflects the Byzantines' equally obvious conviction that their liturgies were habitually mob affairs. Gary Wills's lively description of a method dear to Yale historian of American history, Edmund S. Morgan, mirrors this point of view perfectly. He says, Morgan is too broad in his interest to be confined within a certain type of history, but if he were, but if he were forced back on his last chosen redoubt, it might be called what they said-ism. He is frequently astonished that historians pay so little attention to what the people they are studying wrote about themselves and their world. It may seem unlikely that historians could so often ignore the comments of their own subjects. The quickest way into another person's mind is by way of his or her own words. Admittedly, the words can reflect error, deception or misunderstanding. But the wise skepticism about taking words at face value has become with some an unwillingness to rely on them at all. They turn instead to death rate statistics or any other things that cannot lie. End of quote. As Wills admits, the words of historical witnesses can reflect error, deception, or misunderstanding, but they are infallibly a reliable source, indeed the only source, for what the ones saying them really thought. Scholars in other areas of history and social studies have already long recognized the value of hagiography, folklore, and popular literature for their disciplines. Already in 1947, British Byzantinist Norman Baines wrote, 
it may be worthwhile to suggest the kind of contribution which these monastic stories can make to our understanding of the thought world of the East Romans. Curiously, liturgiologists have been late in waking up to this relatively unexploited, almost inexhaustible and certainly indispensable gold mine of information on the realia of liturgy, what ordinary people really did and thought and what they themselves said about it, regardless of the approved line in the official texts we usually rely on in our histories of liturgy from the top down. In my own work, I have found that the hagiographical and popular literature can not only confirm what we may have suspected all along, but also, and more importantly, can nuance and at times even overturn our cliches, our commonplaces, or presumed certainties, thereby providing a basis for revisionism without which no historical field can advance. There have been considerable advances in the perspectives and methods of the hagiographical sciences, that is to say, the writing of saints. But to go into that would take us too far afield. Suffice it to note that for the historian, the advantage of hagiography and similar popular literature is their ingenuousness, which renders them, from one perspective, reliable beyond suspicion. What I mean by that is that they set their legends only in circumstances that a reader would find plausible. And since the information such sources provide the historian is almost always indirect, never the main point of the account, they can be relied on almost absolutely, something that can rarely be said of other ancient sources. The less important to the narrator the facts are that interest the historian, the more uninflected and hence more reliable the account will be. Indirect evidence tends to be indifferent and therefore free of tendentiousness or intentional deception. For example, if a legend recounts how an unworthy monk's hand withered when he extended it to receive communion, the point the historian of liturgy gleans from the narrative is that at that time one still received communion in the hand. And since that detail is not the point of the narrator's moral, he would have had no reason to falsify it. If we are told a priest was suspended from his ministry because during the liturgy he was caught ogling the women in the galleries, we rightly conclude for the same reason that at least some of the women assisted at the liturgy from the galleries and that they were visible, not hidden behind curtains as is often claimed. These examples are not invented both of them from tales that are actually found in the sources. Does this not lay us open to the dangers of subjectivism? To answer this objection, let us first dispense with some cliches. The popular view that history means the past needs nuancing. History, of course, deals with the past since only God and the seers know the future, though the communists pretended to before they began to run down the drain into the sewer of history in that heady, wonderful year, 1989. History, however, is not yesterday, but today. Not the past, but today's interpretation of the past. Our present vision of whatever in the past seems important enough to remember and interpret. Nietzsche, who died in 1900, said, there are no facts, only interpretation, by which he did not intend to deny the reality of the past, but only to emphasize that events exist for us only as we perceive them, and we perceive them as we want, and we remember them as we perceive them. As I have often recounted, I first realized this during my three years in teaching in Baghdad, Iraq, from 1956 to 1959. In the fall of 1957, Juan Mateus was there doing research in the Syriac-speaking Christian villages and monasteries around Mosul, and I took the train up along the Tigris River to meet him for Christmas. We went out to the villages and monasteries to see the manuscripts he was studying, some of them manuscripts of the Rite of Tikrit, a hitherto unknown Mesopotamian Jacobite tradition he had discovered through his research. Here was the work of the historian firsthand, 
It was like watching the potter at his wheel, and for the first time I saw the scholar's craft as creative. The world of the historian is not just there for everyone to see. Someone must call it into being out of the amorphous mists of the past. So history is not just event, but also perception and interpretation, and perception and interpretation change, often radically. Heloise and Abelard is one of the great love stories of all time, only because in those days there were standards to be broken. Nowadays, the Heloise and Abelard story happens all the time and no one notices because there is no longer any pure sand left on which to leave a trail. That is what Nietzsche means by perception, how we see things, and that is why historians advance our knowledge of the past not by collecting facts, but by explaining them. Raw, uninterpreted data say nothing to the uninitiated. To content oneself with just editing or describing whatever of the past can be gleaned from the sources is to renounce all attempt at writing history. History means perceiving relationships, pointing out connections and causes, hazarding hypotheses, drawing conclusions, in a word, explaining. Unless the sources are explained, their study does not advance our knowledge of history one whit. Knowledge is not the accumulation of data, not even new data, but the perception of relationships in the data, the creation of hypothetical frameworks to explain new data, or to explain in new ways the old data. Only thus can one divine the direction in which things seem to be moving, charter their trajectory, and hypothesize how the gaps in the evidence might be filled in, just as the detective tries to reconstruct a crime from its few remaining clues. Since we can have no direct access to the past, our knowledge of it is inevitably, unavoidably inferential based on what Van Austin Harvey called, I quote, the residue of life that remains long after life itself has run its course, the spent oil lamp, the rusted weapon, the faded document, the mutilated coin, the moldering ruin, end quote. So history must be written ever anew, not because past facts have changed, but because our perception of them has changed. In addition to hagiographical and popular literature, other invaluable sources of the everyday liturgical description are the extant imperial ceremonial books like the Clitorologion of Philotheus from the year 899, the famous book of ceremonies of the Byzantine court compiled from earlier sources by Emperor Constantine the Seventh Porphyrogenitus, who lived from not, who was emperor from 913 to 959, and the 14th century office book, 1350 to 1360, around that time, of Pseudocodinus. How reliable are such idealized descriptions? There is some question as to just how accurately such anthologies, deliberately antiquarian and conservative in intent, represent actual usage at the time of writing. But they do give a picture, if an idealized form, of how ritually formal a view of public life the Byzantines had. Emperor Constantine VII was an antiquarian looking to past models as solutions for present problems, and his book of ceremonies, like most canonical collections, is a compilation of material representing several historical strata, not all of which can be taken uncritically as actually presenting a mirror of contemporary Byzantine society. Nevertheless, some of the rituals in the De Cerimonies are clearly descriptions of actual celebrations, and the continual updating of its prescriptions under Constantine the Seventh successors must betray ongoing relevance to actual practice in court life. This includes the liturgical material of interest to us here, which describes the emperor's participation in stational processions and other religious services in the course of the church here. So even with all the caveats, we can take still the descriptions in the Book of Ceremonies as representing the Byzantines' vision, albeit idealized, of what their celebrations were and might once again be in their own eyes. 
Something analogous must be said of Byzantine ekphrasis, idealized descriptions, that is, of church buildings in their liturgical dispositions. Those of Paul Silenciarius are the most famous, perhaps, but there are many others. As historian of Byzantine architecture Robert Usterhout has reminded us, however, an ekphrasis had a literary function that took precedence over the exactness of the recording. This is not to say that a Byzantine description of a work of architecture does not reflect the truth, and most are remarkably ac accurate, as Wolf once demonstrated by comparing ekphrasis with surviving buildings. But the ekphrasis emphasized perceptual understanding and may best be understood as expressions of spiritual realities than as archaeological records." End quote. Such sources then dealing with the real liturgical life of Byzantium as it really was, and as they saw it, not just as it was supposed to be, I have tried to exploit in these lectures with more explicit attention, perhaps, than in my other writings. For the Byzantines themselves must be allowed to speak in a book entitled, Through Their Own Eyes, Liturgy as the Byzantine Sword. Let's turn now to the introduction, having already in the preface indicated several aspects of what I intend to do in these lectures. The introduction is entitled Liturgy and the Appeal to the Past. And I preface it with a citation from Cyril of Scythopolis, who died in 558 in his life of St. Sabas, where he says, everything that belongs to antiquity is worthy of respect. For over a century now, the Christian churches, first of the West and also of the East, have been preoccupied with liturgical renewal under the influence of what is known as the liturgical movement, a worldwide effort dedicated to making Christian liturgy better but good liturgy is liturgy that glorifies God and sanctifies those glorifying him, and that is, his, that is his gift to us, not ours to him. For we can glorify God only by accepting the unmerited gift of sanctification he freely gives us. If it is God who does it, then how could it be better? It could be better from our side, for we too have a part in liturgy which is neither magic nor unconscious. So God's part would better achieve its aim if we would drink more fully from the saving waters he offers us in the liturgy via a participation that would be more active, more conscious, more com communal, as Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Vatican II Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, and the decrees and documents that flowed from it reiterate and paraphrase time and again. For the Vatican Council, this is not just a question of aesthetics. The Council boldly asserts that full lay participation in worship is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy and of the assembly of the baptized, which is the Church. In the struggle for renewal, it has become a commonplace to refer, as I did in 1977 in a fit of youthful romanticism, to the liturgical spirit of the Golden Age of the Fathers, when pagan society became Christendom by the saving power of word and sacrament celebrated in the liturgical assembly. In a very real sense, I said, the whole life of the Church in the patristic period was liturgical. There were no Christian schools or catechism classes, no popular missions or retreats, but there were the daily assemblies for morning and evening prayer. On the Lord's Day there was the vigil and Eucharistic synaxis with lessons and homilies, and there was Lent when the bishop prepared the community's candidates for Easter baptism with long catechetical homilies such as have come down to us from the contemporaries John Chrysostom, Cyril and John II of Jerusalem, and Theodore of Mopswestia. Even the more mundane ministries were part and parcel of the liturgical assembly. Offerings for the sick and poor were brought there and given to the deacons who saw to their distribution. It was there that catechumens were instructed and initiated, penitents reconciled, the wayward corrected, 
How a modern compartmentalization of life into clearly defined and mutually exclusive categories was foreign to the early church, whose life was liturgical in that it was a community whose every activity was liturgia, a public service of the one body of Christ. So that's what I said at that time. In the same spirit, Monsignor Frederick R. McManus, one of the greats of the United States Catholic movement for liturgical renewal, recently described the liturgical renewals, and I quote, fresh breadth and flexibility, as flowing from a genuine return to evangelical and patristic sources, a return to the venerable traditions of the early post-biblical centuries. Unquote. This echoes the mandate of the Vatican II Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy that the rites be restored to the vigor they had in the tradition of the Fathers. Pope St. Pius V used the same language in 1570 in the liturgical restoration following the Council of Trent, which went from 1545 to 1563. It was an almost endless council. The Pope spoke of restoring the Roman Missal, I quote, to the pristine norm of the Holy Fathers. Thus the process of liturgical renewal is a matter of restoration and recovery, scrutinizing the past precedents for what can be pastorally sound in the present. Alas, the past of this golden age of the liturgy, instead of being scrutinized, has often been invented and exploited to justify decisions already made are reduced to cliches in support of some vision or other of reality that will not stand up to a rereading of the sources. So my approach in these lectures will be unapologetically socio-historical because I am an unabashed historian of Eastern liturgy, chiefly though by no means exclusively Byzantine liturgy. In the process, I hope to overturn some of the popular cliches concerning liturgy in the life of Byzantium, an era stretching from the patristic period of late antiquity, roughly from the founding of Constantinople in 324, until the tragedy of its fall to the Turks in 1453. R. A. Marcus spoke of the work of that great historian of Christian late antiquity in the early Middle Ages, Peter Brown of Princeton, as one who has done more than any living historian, I quote, to rescue the past from the tyranny of stereotypes. That indeed is the task of the historian. So history must be written ever anew, not because the past facts have changed, but because our perception of them has changed. This is especially true in the case of Byzantium, perceptions of which have fluctuated wildly. The word Byzantium may immediately conjure up an image of remoteness, obscurity, and labyrinthine complexity. It is often handled as a useful term of abuse. Anybody frustrated by the machinery of an organization is likely to criticize it as a Byzantine bureaucracy. As a subject of possible study, Byzantium may inspire reactions of fascination or repellence. Why find out about this society? Why indeed? Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines the term Byzantine as, I quote, characterized by a devious and unusually surreptitious manner of operation, labyrinthine. No one or not even the Byzantines call themselves Byzantine. They call themselves Romei, Romans. Those the Byzantines call Greeks were the pagans. And the Byzantines vilified the Greeks in their wisdom, even in the texts of the liturgy. Byzantine is a Western neologism derived from Byzantium, or Byzantium, an ancient Greek port town beautifully and strategically situated on a peninsula overlooking the Bosphorus that would become first Constantinople, then Istanbul, and would give rise to Byzantium as the name for the empire and culture centered in that capital. The German scholar Hieronymus Wolff, librarian and secretary of the Fugger family in Augsburg in the 16th century, was the first to use the Latin neuter as we now spell it, Byzantium, in that modern sense in 1557. The name was not Wolf's creation, however. As early as Andrea Dondolo's 14th century chronicle, we see Byzantium used in connection with a prophecy about the fall of Constantinople to the Latins in 1204. 
the stunningly located port town of Byzantium, in existence from at least the 12th century BC, suddenly catapulted into world prominence in the year 324, when Emperor Constantine I chose it at his, as his eastern capital, inaugurated on May 11, 330. So ironically, Byzantium did not become Byzantine until it had been rechristened Constantinople leaving the original name of the port city to designate the millennial-long culture, Constantinople, from 330 to 1453, and its empire would produce. In these lectures, I use the term Byzantines broadly to include the inhabitants of the Byzantine Empire, successor to the Eastern Roman Empire that lasted from the dedication of its capital, Constantinople, in 330, until its last shrunken remnant fell to the Turks, in 1453. For some reason, this Byzantium is a subject which has provoked a curious hostility, even among its own practitioners. The Byzantinists, much abused by Western savants, especially in Great Britain, where being snotty about things is apparently good form, Byzantium has been called all sorts of awful things. William Lickie's <coughs> 1869 History of European Morals declared, and I quote, Of the Byzantine Empire, the universal verdict of history is that it constitutes, with scarcely an exception, the most thoroughly base and despicable form that civilization has yet assumed. End quote. Prominent British Byzantine historian J.B. Burry proclaimed that Constantine inaugurated a millennium in which reason was enchained, thought was enslaved, and knowledge made no progress. End quote. Some British have even said preposterously that Greece was unlucky enough to have no history of consequence between antiquity and the 19th century. The French, never willing to play second fiddle to their British rivals, had their say too. Voltaire, who lived from 1694 to 1778, allowed that Byzantium's, and I quote, worthless history contains nothing but declamation and miracles. It is a disgrace to the human mind, end quote. Perhaps these pundits used Byzantium as a foil because, as Averill Cameron suggests, most Byzantinists came to study Byzant Byzantium from somewhere else, from classical and or oriental philology, from classical antiquity, from history, from medieval studies, from art history, from theology, whatever, and have been unable to look at Byzantium in itself free of earlier presuppositions and not by comparison with something else. Or perhaps it is the presumed cultural superiority of those who dismiss Eastern civilizations as inferior. For the Byzantines were not the only Eastern Christians pilloried by Westerners convinced of being their betters. Johann Gottfried von Herder, 1784-1791, said of the Syriac Christians, I quote, these degenerate people were for the most part a contemptible race deserving to ride upon asses, as incapable of managing the generous steed and unworthy of the cross upon their churches, end quote. And Ernest Renan, 1823 to 1892, opined that, and I quote, the characteristic of the Syrians is a certain mediocrity. They shone neither in, neither in war nor in the arts nor in science. They altogether lacked the poetic fire of the older Hebrews and the Arabs, end quote. Apparently, Renan had never heard of St. Ephraim. It is comforting for today's scholars to see what bigoted fools some of our predecessors could be. We think we must look better by comparison. But surely at least our topic, liturgy, was safe from such broadsides. If there is one thing everyone now agrees the Byzantines did well, at least aesthetically, it is surely liturgy and its enveloping iconography. Alas, not even these were spared. Byzantine art was once derided as stiff, stilted, stagnantly repetitive, following church canons rather than artistic inspiration. As for Byzantine liturgy, Dom Prosper Guéranger, Benedictine abbot of Solem in France from 1805, he lived from 1805 to 1875, and a prime mover at the birth of the modern liturgical movement in the West, dismissed Orthodox liturgy with derision and contempt. Chapter 9 of his monumental Institution Liturgique is full of outrageous statements like, and I quote, 
One must note in the Greek liturgy a particular quality which admirably denotes the degradation of the church that employs it. This quality is a crude immobilism that renders it impervious to any progress. The Greek church has become impotent at renewal in its own course, and schism and heresy have paralyzed it at the heart. In brief, the Eastern Rites are the liturgical families of a degenerate Christianity. End of the series of quotations which I've kind of sewed together from his writings. Such views are, of course, those of the past, fortunately a dead past, views based on Renaissance and enlightened presuppositions that divided history, Western history, of course, the only one thought worthy of the name, into the still useful categories of classical antiquity, late antiquity, the Dark and Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and modernity, to which one must now add post-modernity. In this vision, classical culture and its literature were good, and the Renaissance was a rebirth because it pretended to be a revival, though of course one can never recover the past, never mind revive it. The Middle Ages were not just middle, but middling, mediocre, because they fall between those two, those two periods viewed as good. For Enlightenment propagators of this vision, like Edward Gibbon, of rise and fall fame, Christianity and the Christian-dominated cultures originating in late antiquity, in other words, from around 250 to 800, like that of Byzantium, were hardly a source of inspiration and human progress. The scholarly world views things differently today. What the great German Byzantinist Hans Georg Beck, Hans Georg Beck 1910-1999, called Das Byzantinische Jahrtausend, the Byzantine Millennium, is now a major object of sympathetic study throughout the academic world. And the monuments of its religious art and architecture occupy a disproportionately large percentage of the art historians at work in the United States and elsewhere. The mere fact that this civilization lasted over a thousand years was suffocated only by force majeure and still survives today in the orthodox culture the Romanian Byzantinist Nicholas Yorga, 1871-1940, famously christened Byzance après Byzance, Byzantium after Byzantium, should be enough to catch the attention of the unbiased student of cultural history. This has been an overlong introduction, but I thought it useful and hopefully instructive to give you a sense of history's subjectivities, of how historians work and how their interpretations fluctuate. For history, as Nietzsche said, is not so much facts as interpretation, and the historians of liturgy must weave their interpretations out of the raw, undyed threads of the past. I first experienced this, if you will permit a personal reminiscence, during my years teaching at Baghdad College in the 1950s, when the great Juan Mateos, who lived from 1917 to 2003, later to be my doctoral mentor at the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome, was in Iraq doing research in the Syriac-speaking Christian villages and monasteries around Mosul, and I took the train up along the Tigris to meet him for Christmas in 1956. We went out to the villages and monasteries to see the Syriac liturgical manuscripts he was studying. Some of the manuscripts of the rite of Tikrit, newly famous as Saddam Hussein's stronghold at the northern tip of the Sunni Triangle in war-torn Iraq. Mateus had discovered this hitherto unknown Mesopotamian Jacobite liturgical tradition through his manuscript research. Here was the work of the historian firsthand. It was like watching the potter at his wheel, and for the first time I saw the scholar's craft as creative. The world of the historian is not just there for everyone to see. Someone must call it into being out of the, out of the amorphous mists of the past. That is especially true of the sort of history I envision here, the story of what real people did at prayer, and more important, what they themselves thought about it. Such things must often be teased out of the sources, and when we do so, we may come up with a somewhat revisionist view of that history, the only kind I consider worth having, one that hopefully will overturn some of our modern clichés about Byzantine culture, art, and liturgy. As Professor Owen Cummings of Mount St. Angel in Aragon once said, church history is the liberation theology. 
The limited time at our disposition imposes selectivity, of course. Byzantium covered an entire millennium of time, and the number of historical sources available for the study, even of so limited a topic as its liturgy, is overwhelming. So I shall concentrate on cathedral rather than monastic liturgy, that is to say, I'll concentrate on the liturgy of the secular churches, not of the monasteries, and shall deal chiefly with the Eucharist and its attendant rites, rather than the liturgy of the hours and other services, which pertain not exclusively but more to the monastic uh, uh, usage. Even within those parameters, I shall skim over some topics of special contemporary interest, like the role of women, because I have covered them elsewhere in other writings. The same is true of the liturgy of the hours, liturgical psalmody and chant, the veneration of saints, the frequency of the Eucharist and of Holy Communion, on all of which I have already left my footprints. Other topics like funerals and pilgrimages have recently been handled anew by others. So I must be selective. But all history is selective anyway. And besides, my aim here has not been to write a history of the Byzantine Rite, which I have already done. A book should consist of examples, wrote Wittgenstein. So I have set out to give you examples of what liturgy was really like as the Byzantines themselves saw it. Before I say farewell to Byzantium, as one of the greatest modern Byzantinists, Hans Georg Beck of Munich, entitled one of his last publications, Abschied von Byzantz. For in a sense, these 2005 Manolis lectures were intended as my Abschied von Byzantz, my goodbye to Byzantium, a world I had inhabited spiritually and academically for over half a century. With William Butler Yeats, 1865, to 1939, I had indeed, as he wrote, sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Albert Camus, once, uh, 1913 to 1960, once said, it is possible to live a life of wild excitement whatever le without ever leaving one's desk, meaning that the life of the mind can be as challenging and exciting as any heroic enterprise. That describes for me my years in Byzantium and its satellites, Armenia, Palestine, Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and so on. So without sailing to Byzantium, as Yeats' famous poem would have it, for that is no country for old men, he says, but flying to California instead, where I first gave these lectures, I anticipated, since I am still at it, my Abschied von Byzantz during the prestigious Manolis lecture series of a Greek Orthodox Institute. For Greek Orthodoxy is the culture that created Byzantium and that has sustained it and been sustained by it in the more somber years of Byzance après Byzance. It has been for me a great adventure, enormously rewarding, rewarding spiritually and intellectually, and also a lot of fun. Now I am 80, going on 82 and still counting, and like all of us, must eventually move on, but Byzantium will be with me wherever I go. For I have loved Byzantium and tried to teach others to love it too. I hope that these lectures show you why. Anyway, thanks for listening in on my adventure. Oh,